Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our sustainability and manufacturing webinar discussing the strategy and approach of international manufacturers towards implementing sustainable goals. My name is Rose Catherine. I am and have been for several years an active member of the French American Chamber of Commerce in Atlanta. This webinar is organized by a group of seven Atlanta-based bilateral business organizations representing France, Japan, Germany, the Netherlands, the UK, Belgium, and Sweden, who regularly work together in the Southeast US, promoting their communities and providing valuable contents to their members. For this event, we are partnering with the Global Change Program and the Ray C. Anderson Center for Sustainable Business at Georgia Tech, Next Generation Manufacturing, the Society of Plastic Engineers Southern, and Global Atlanta. I would like to personally thank Kim Cobb, Professor and Director of the Global Change Program at Georgia Tech, Jessica Quark, Board Member at the Japan American Society of Georgia, and Aurelie de Malibran, Member of the French American Chamber of Commerce for their work, ideas, and passion over this past year to make this event happen, including moving in from an in-person panel discussion, initially scheduled in April, in April at the Candida Building at Georgia Tech, a landmark of green buildings in the Southeast to a webinar format. For your questions to our panelists, please answer them in the Q&A panel. They will be answered during the last 15 minutes of this webinar. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Valerie Thomas, Anderson Interface Professor of Natural System in the Middle School of Industrial and Systems Engineering at Georgia Tech. Valerie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rose. And it is my great pleasure to very briefly welcome our panelists today. Uh, we have Sarah Irvani, who is the CEO of Okabashi Brands. We have Jim Reed, who is president of YKK Corporation of America. Nicola Coudre Moreau, who is Group General Manager for Research and Innovation at Solvay Specialty Polymers. And Andy Brem, who is Site Director at Gainesville Bio Operations for Boehringer Ingelheim Animal Health. And so that our panelists can uh, really fill in the introduction of themselves, I would like to ask each of the panelists to give a very brief overview of your presence globally in the US and in Georgia, and also to pick just very briefly one of your sustainability goals that you think may be different from those of the other companies represented here and tell us about it. Um, perhaps uh, we can go in any order you want. We could start with Sarah Irvani and you can transition to yourselves uh, naturally if you don't need my prompting. Well, thank you so much for having me. My name is Sarah Irvani. I'm CEO of Okabashi Brands. We are a Georgia-based footwear manufacturer. Currently only 1% of shoes are being manufactured in the US. We um, manufacture them locally and distribute them nationally in large chains, ranging from um, Target, CVS, um, lots of the big box stores, and also then export to a lot of international markets as well. In terms of sustainability, we uh, produce recyclable products and so do both closed loop manufacturing and post-consumer sort of more circular products as well. I'd like to take your turn, Jim Reed. Oh yes, yeah, sorry, you're on mute. I was like, oh, I, I hope was. I'm in next because I can't hear. Yes, I'm Jim Reed. I'm president of YKK Corporation of America. Happy to be here. YKK is a global corporation. We're headquartered in Japan. Um, we have 46,000 employees around the world. We operate in 72 countries and territories around the world. Um, I work for YKK Corporation of America, which is headquartered here in Marietta, Georgia. We, uh, we, this is our regional headquarters for North and Central America, but also here in Marietta, we have our U.S. fastening headquarters, as well as our architectural products headquarters. We have 2 million square feet of manufacturing space in Macon, Georgia, 
and another million down in Dublin, Georgia for the architectural products business. We have about 1,600 employees in Georgia and about 2,500 uh, across the country. And um, we manufacture zippers and snaps and buttons for apparel, uh, also for automotive and a number of other industries, as well as architectural products for commercial and residential buildings. As far as sustainable initiatives that, that may be different, um, I think that one of, the, one of the interesting things about YKK, I think, is that it's all driven from our founder's philosophy. Uh, so it's called a cycle of goodness. And he, he started this back in the late 30s, but um, it continues on and it kind of drives everything that we do. So with the help of the um, sustainable development goals, we've been able to kind of translate that beyond just the traditional concepts of product sustainability or production sustainability, but also the broader community sustainability gender equality, good jobs, and how that relates to the health of the community overall. So with the help of those concepts, we've been able to expand our, our principles. You told me to be short. You Run were, ahead. thank you. I want to come back to you in a minute. Uh, uh, Nicola, uh, perhaps you would like to be the next person to introduce himself. Sure, uh, great to, to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. So my name is Nicolas Cudrimou. I'm based in Brussels, Belgium. I'm the CTO of the Solvay Group and also in charge of the research organization for our advanced polymers business. Um, so Solvay is a 157 years old company uh, started by making soda ash and we still make a lot of soda ash today. Um, and we're basically uh, involved in two main businesses. One is specialty chemicals. The other one is high performance materials. Uh, we have 24, more than 24,000 people around the world, including uh, 5,500 uh, 5, in the US, a little bit more than that, um, and more than 700 in, uh, in Georgia. Uh, and Georgia is mainly about high performance materials. Uh, so mainly high performance polymers and composite materials for aeronautics or let's say mobility applications. Um, and uh, a significant research center in Alpharetta in Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, so if I have to pick one of our goals, which is directly related to our materials businesses, uh, this is all about the circular economy and our goal is very simple. It's to double the, um, the sales from what we, what we call circular sales. In other words, uh, materials that are part of a, of, um, of a cycle uh, of um, basically recycling, reuse, uh, compatible with the circular economy. And um, that's one that is challenging, but also guiding uh, some of our research directions. We can talk about that later. Great, thank you. And um, Andy Brem. Hi there, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I come from Beringer Ingelheim uh, Animal Health. Uh, we have about 10,000 employees around the world dedicated to delivering value through innovation and enhancing the well-being of animals and people. We believe that the lives of animals and humans are connected in deep and complex ways, and we know when animals are healthy, uh, humans are healthy too. Respect for animals, humans, and the environment is at the heart of what we do. We develop solutions and provide services to protect animals from disease and pain, and uh, we support our customers in taking care of uh, health of their animals and protect our communities against life and society-threatening diseases. Uh, we're the second largest animal health company in the world. We have about 4.5 billion euro of turnover per year, and we have presence, presence in more than 150 countries. Uh, in Georgia, we employ about 1,200 people uh, at a number of different locations in the U.S., uh, but in Georgia, 1,200 people. We've got locations in uh, Metro Atlanta at, at our uh, U.S. Uh, Duluth headquarters. We've got a manufacturing site in Athens, Georgia, uh, with about 400 people, and here in the poultry capital of the world, in Gainesville, Georgia, we have about 260 people. Uh, we, did, we manufacture poultry vaccines and we distribute our products to about 60 countries around the world. Uh, in terms of uh, sustainability goals, I would say as a part of our, our, our Be Green program, which is a corporate initiative, uh, which aims to reduce or, or minimize our environmental impacts, 
uh, we, we do have a strong goal to foster uh, green investments. Uh, and since most uh, eco-friendly technology is rarely the cheapest, uh, at first glance at least, uh, we use uh, we, an internal carbon pricing methodology uh, to balance out additional upfront costs as an incentive to choose efficient, sustainable solutions. Uh, this is an effective way to combine sustainable development and the bottom line because most of the time, at least in my experience, energy efficient solutions are the, are the cheapest in the long run. So we use this carbon tax to help, uh, I would say, balance out uh, from a valuation and prioritization perspective. Terrific. Thank you. Um, and uh, before we move into the harder questions, I really want to thank all of you for joining this um, this uh, webinar. And I think it, it sort of helps the community in Georgia and globally to know more about what you're doing, which I think uh, needs to be better known. So I have a special question for each of you. Um, and I'll start with Sarah, Irvani, Sarah. Um, so you're a local manufacturer. How is being a local manufacturer a game changer for sustainability? I think when you think when you think about sort of post consumer um, circularity, one of the biggest impediments to that and challenges is the reverse logistics piece. And if you're able to do your manufacturing close to the end customer, that just helps to close the circle and. Um, and Andy, as Andy was saying, sort of when you look at the cost element, then um, it sort of balances out in a way that could sway decisions in terms of engaging circularity versus not. So I think that sort of looking at the loop and the geography of the loop is so, so critical. Um, so that's, I, um, I would just take a, a second to just follow up on this. So with your um reverse logistics in the region can you just name what are the products that um are involved in that sure for example um we have a line of footwear uh, that we distribute nationally at target so most targets that you walk in there'll be a sort of a wall of okabashi shoes mm -hmm. and uh I think that the durability of the product is important, but let's say you have too little room in your closet and you want to get rid of the shoe, we invite customers to send them back and get a discount off their next pair. And then we're able to regrind them on site and reuse them sort of to make new shoes with higher recycled content. Um, when you look at a lot of non U.S. footwear manufacturing in particular, but I think it applies broadly. Um, to close that loop, they would then have to ship the shoe back to um, offshore. So it economically might not make sense in terms of the dollars and cents. Well, thank you very much. I think, as you said, you're the only shoe manufacturer that seems to be doing that, at least uh, here. So thank you. Um, Jim Reed at YKK. Um, could you please tell us about an example of when a change in consumer behavior led to changes in YKK's business from a sustainability perspective? You mean other than what's happening right now? <laughs> um, I, you know, it's, it's an open question. Today, an that, would a, that would be today, I think, would be a, would be a tremendous example. I wanted to add on to Sarah's point about the, not just the, the, there is no closed loop, really. You know, we, and the size of the loop when you're talking about uh, global manufacturing or importing things like apparel or shoes, the, the, I think another point is the size of that loop even if there is such a even let's assume there is a loop and it's not just a one-way trip to and then eventually to a landfill but um that's a long trip and that's there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of energy that is expended to get those shoes so um having local manufacturer has a tremendous impact on the whole supply chain too um as far as the dra drastic change for for ykk um you know we have uh we have seen the explosion of e-commerce. So we were already, we're, we're not the fastest moving global company in the world, but you see the, the shifts. Um, and so you get a lot of information very quickly. The, the 
the pandemic has accelerated those things and other drives by by for for e-commerce and we have had to respond but that also provides you a lot more information and i think what we're seeing now is a real shift by the consumer demanding more sustainable products especially in apparel and so there's a recognition of the of of how the how apparel ends up in the, the landfill and the demand for that, you know, the apparel industry to participate in the circular economy. And so we are leaning into that very quickly and the pandemic seems to be accelerating that. You know, they talk about how crisis um, reveals character. Well, crisis also tends to accelerate these shifts. And I think we're in the middle of it right now. Um, and so we are changing our products dramatically in order to meet the demand of our brand holders and they are responding to the demands of the consumer for those sustainable products and to participate in that circular economy. Yes, absolutely. Can you give an example of, I don't know, a more sustainable zipper or um, some other fastener or, or what something that- Absolutely, so, so on the zipper side, um, we we are used we've had recycled we've had zippers made from recycled products for over 20 years it's our natulon zipper has been around for 20 years um, it was not as popular as it is now now it is tremendously popular so it's it i think you can see that components or apparel made from recycled material will be pretty much table stakes for folks um, and also you know we, we use recycled material in our, from our source products. We recycle our material, but also we, we, we make plant-based zippers. That's an interesting innovation, uh, actually made from sugar cane. Uh, so there's, you're going to see a lot of changes like that. When you the talk about the zipper, zipper is from sugar cane, not just well, yeah, the, like a coil zipper, but not a brass zipper. Right? We haven't figured out how to make brass from, you know, not like, not like a jean zipper, but the, you know, like a dress, a zipper for your dress. It is, it is interesting, the, the novelty bio-based uh, materials that are, are coming out and, you know, we, we work a lot with them and sort of turn our factory into a bit of a dirty lab at, at times and just see what will run and what not. And I think that that point between R&D and commercialization is just getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And it's interesting to see how all the different stakeholders are, are playing their part in that. Yeah, and, 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 and you see what happens. I, years ago, I worked for Georgia Pacific, and, and they were starting to do recycled or, or compostable uh, uh, um, uh, utensils, forks and knives. And, and the forks and knives were fine, but the spoons were a problem early on because <laughs> if you use them for soup, they tend to melt in your soup. <laughs> now, you know, the, the, you know, once you start to get that demand, then everybody starts to, okay, yeah, the, we have that now and it's, and, it's, and it's regularly available. And, you know, when, when you look at a piece of apparel, let's say a pair of jeans, and, and you want it to be part of the circular economy. And one thing is you, you take it to Goodwill and somebody, my kids buy it. Um, but the other aspect would be to return it to the manufacturer and then they, they would recycle it. But when you have these metal objects in the apparel, it, it can be an obstruction. So um, what we're going to be seeing is removable metal parts in apparel that can be more easily removed. So rivets and things can be removed. So part of that circular economy beyond just the notion of oh, this is made from recycled material, things like that. Hmm. Great. So Nicholas, let's bring you into the conversation. Um, you are at Solve. Solvay's core business is manufacturing materials. And as we've just been discussing, the circular economy promotes reduction of the use of virgin materials. So what does this mean for Solvay? All right, so let me build a little bit on, on what Jim was just explaining, because there are some obvious uh, things we do as a chemical company. When we have waste, obviously we try to turn that waste within the plant where it was generated back into raw materials that can be useful either in the same process or an adjacent process. So going back to molecules that are clean and, and reusable. So basically treating waste at the source. And frankly speaking, that's pretty 
obvious I and mean, we should do that. Uh, it makes not only sustainability, but also economical sense. So it's a win-win at least, if not win-win-win. Um, the second step goes back to what Sarah was talking about uh, in uh, bio-based ingredients. You can make amazing molecules, not only with oil-based um, raw materials, but also with, uh, with uh, natural raw materials. This is definitely a very significant development area. Um, we have to adapt our processes. In some cases, uh, chemistry and biotechnology need to come together. Um, but there is um, a huge progress made in this area. And we even have, we begin to see cases where molecules can be made better through a biotech route than a chemical route. Uh, for a long time, it was the opposite. I and mean, biotech was leading to very slow processes or costly processes or low level of uh, purity. Now we are talking about really another tool in the toolbox that can be used. Now there is another one I wanted to focus on, um, uh, which is uh, the impact circular economy has on the innovation process. Uh, I always tell our customers, we sell products but we develop solutions for you. And a customer like, uh, like Jim, for example, who is surely buying plastics to make his zippers, um, yes, he will buy these plastics, but he will expect probably from his supplier more than just a bag of material to put in his molding machines. Um, and what I'm talking about is that the solution is usually the combination of a material a design of a part, in the case of, um, of a part, and a process to make the part. And, um, and so I want people in our teams working on solutions to really look at all the aspects and to include circular economy uh, criteria right from the beginning. In other words, not look at circular economy after the fact when we have a new material uh, in a given application and then think about, oh, wow, we forgot about circular economy. How can we fix that, right? The fixing is usually difficult and costly. If you integrate that in the development process right from the beginning, the story is completely different. Now you have options that you do not have if you do things in a, in a linear way. One example, we, are, we invest significantly in batteries, materials for next generation batteries, critical for electrification, next generation mobility. And right from the beginning, we work on the recycling of batteries with partners, critical partners in, the, in that supply chain. And not only with people who will make and sell batteries using our ingredients, but with people who will collect the batteries and treat the waste people like Veolia. We just announced a partnership with them and we are part, on, part of, a, of an alliance on, uh, on battery development. And so it's very interesting to see that taking into account circular economy goals right from the beginning really maximizes the probability to develop the right solutions that integrate these aspects. And I think this has a potential that is tremendous. I'm, uh, Looking at circular economy after the fact gives you only the visible tip of the iceberg. There is a huge potential below if we take that into account at the development stage. Thank you. Um, Andy, um, it's your turn now to make this leap even bigger. And so I'm going to ask you um, about your carbon neutrality initiative, which gets back to this whole uh, question of the circular economy. Yes, thank you, Valerie. Yeah, so we are we do have quite an ambitious program that we're running here at our site in Gainesville uh, to achieve uh, carbon neutrality in 2021. So it's a it's a project that's currently in process. It's a little difficult to do for a manufacturing site, especially a vaccine manufacturing site, for a number of reasons, which I, I may speak to a little bit later. Uh, but we're following a four-step process: a definition, a reduction, carbon offsetting, and then and communication. Uh, we're currently in the reduction phase of the project, which is obviously the most important and the most intense. Uh, to achieve this goal, we've done a number of different things, uh, ranging from uh, installation of solar panels on rooftops, and uh, we're in the process of, of adding a solar canopy to our one of our parking areas for about 100 vehicles. 
uh, which has a, a, a good carbon reduction, about 390 metric tons of carbon reduction uh, for our site uh, for the year, to uh, simple things but yet impactful things as replacing all of our our incandescent and fluorescent light bulbs with LEDs. So we've changed out more than 1,500 light bulbs here at the site. Seems small, but it, all these things make a big difference in the end. Uh, dimmer switches, proximity switches in office and production and distribution areas. Uh, we've replaced uh, insulation on, on process piping or steam piping uh, to reduce uh, heat loss. Uh, we've uh, put smart meters uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, some uh, building electrical systems so that we can track usage and figure out how we can further reduce uh, energy consumption uh, and you know other things that uh, 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 such as using uh, or installing electrical vehicle charging stations for our own fleet vehicles. Also, it's a means for us to encourage our employees uh, to use electric vehicles. We can provide them a location to charge their vehicles when they're here working on site, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we also, as a part of this uh, program, we plan to purchase uh, green electricity uh, and also engage in environmental projects to offset any carbon that we can't fully reduce, carbon emissions that we can't fully reduce. So our, our intent here is to be the first uh, production site in the U.S. for within Beringer Ingelheim uh, to become carbon neutral, and we're uh, working hard at this, and um, uh, we'll be very happy uh, to see this come to fruition. Um, let me, let me, add, there are a whole bunch of things that you said. Um, so I have several questions just to follow up on that. Um, during the COVID pandemic, um, have you been shut down to some degree? And has that helped you make some of these transitions, like switching out all the light bulbs and uh, improving the piping? Or has that not really affected your operations? No, I would, uh, we have, uh, uh, we do have folks that are working, it's a great question. We do have folks that are working from home, but we're a manufacturing site. Uh, we do all of our own uh, quality control testing final product release here on site. So our, our value add is here on site. So we have been running through the pandemic. We've got a, a great team here on site that have kind of pushed through it and uh, really been quite committed and vigilant. We're very proud of them. Uh, so it, it hasn't it has in administrative areas uh, in areas where people are working from home, but for the production areas, which are typically going to be laboratory areas, class B, class A uh, work environments, uh, it hasn't really afforded us too much uh, uh, availability to uh, do some changeovers of some of the uh, fundamental systems. Okay. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Um, so all of you, all of your companies are just fantastic uh, in what you're doing in sustainability. And uh, my, my inclination is to ask you more about these successes. But I'm going to ask you instead, um, what in your work on sustainability in your companies, can you name, um, and I'll let each panelist address this, you know, which sustainability goal is most challenging? Like this, this can't just be a walk in the park all the time. There must be things that are just uh, either have caused you a lot of difficulty or been really hard to do, or you still don't know what you're going to do. Can, uh, can we just go through the cycle again and hear about some of the hard parts? Well, I, I, I touched on it earlier. And I think you're seeing this incredible acceleration of the consumer drive and appreciation for um, not just circularity, but sustainability in all its complexity. And it's interesting in our work is that we see most brands, we do contract manufacturing as well as our own brands. Most brands have a different take of what Instagram flash of their description of sustainability that their customer is looking for and how that then translates into product development. So for example, some people want to really talk about the fact that they can have a product that's 45% recycled material, others that it is recyclable and the closed loop, others that it's locally manufactured and the human aspect of it. And so I think that being able to quickly respond to these very divergent interpretations of the most important aspect of sustainability um, is, is a challenge because it puts you in, in all different R&D directions and, and it's challenging to, to then go from R&D to full commercialization um, within a fashion year. So that, that's a little bit on us what the challenge is. 
Thank you. Um, Jim, do you have any challenges in sustainability? Oh, no challenges. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> No, I think that the I think the overarching uh, challenge for pursuit sustainability is not in the capabilities of the R and D engineers or the engineers in the facility or the consultants that come. The big challenge is, frankly, especially with consumer products, consumers want sustainable products, but they have yet to have an inclination to pay more for them. And these processes cost more money, uh, and that's 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 been a break for for a long time. Not just recently. I mean, this is the whole. This is what's been a slowdown for everything. Is when will when you know when will the pressure be that you have to invest, or when will be the return on investment um, when when the when the demand is that we, that we like sustainable products but we're not going to pay any more for them, even though it costs more to, to do that. Mm -hmm. So just I'll press on this. How do you, how do you weigh that? Do you say, Oh, we're just going to do more sustainable products and we'll either eat the cost or we'll charge more and hope we can maintain market share or, or we'll just make less sustainable products because people won't buy them. Like, how do you I think that now we're seeing a breaking point where it's, it's it, sustainable products or recycled products or compostable products. Uh, more environmentally friendly products were a, a nice to have a long time ago. They were really important a while ago, um, and now they're just demanded. So I think we're going to see a lot of change where the consumer starts to make the demand, then that will start working its way down the supply chain. And uh, how do you do it? You, 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 you make it work just like any, any other thing. I mean, you know, the, Wages have to go up, energy prices go up, uh, material prices go up, but still you try to figure out a way to make your product uh, le less and less expensive every year. So you touch on every lever you can. Just one more on this. So your consumer though, some consumers are buying the fasteners, the zippers, but many consumers are buying the dress or the right. pair of jeans. And so you, you have this intermediate who is your customer who's then selling to the consumer. So that must be a challenge. As oh, well. we, we've got, well, we've got the, the ultimate consumer and, and we've got the retailer or the e-tailer, which may or may not be the brand. And then you have the contract manufacturer. So now you have many, many, many players that are playing in that process. So um, yeah, so it's more than just an intermediary. There's many intermediaries. So it all has to get pushed down, but the consumer gets the vote. There's only one vote and then the consumer gets the vote. So when the consumer demands it, then, then it will happen. Yeah. Um, Nicholas, for you, um, I could already start and ask you whether your bio-based products are cheaper. But let me just give you uh, the ability to answer any, any way you like about your sustainability, what's hardest for uh, Solve and sustainability. And to continue a little bit again in the same direction, um, I, I will focus obviously on our uh, circular economy targets. So significantly increasing our sales from, uh, from circular economy compatible products. Mm -hmm. and it, we have exactly the same the same problem as the one Jim described. I, uh, uh, being sustainable is one thing; uh, being competitive can be another one. And and obviously the goal is to have to have both and right? to be to be financially competitive and to contribute to a circular economy and uh, and reduce our environmental footprint. And um, and so one area we are looking at. Uh, it's challenging, but um, is the is the concept of changing the business models, and in some cases we we find that there are opportunities to change or modify the business model so that we can reach that end instead of or, and um, and that can be a, a powerful way. It doesn't work everywhere. Obviously, you need some flexibility in the in the value chain and the role you can play in it or the partnerships you can develop. But sometimes it takes a different business model to really combine uh, sustainability and value creation. Uh, so that has potential. Another one, back to the comment Sarah was making about people and, uh, and, um, and almost, I would say, psychological aspects. 
is the perception we need to change in the, uh, in the, in the buyers, uh, especially the end users around recycled um, products, which are always still perceived as lower quality, lower performance. Now I agree with Jim, there is a change. You can see people maybe not looking at recycled as better quality, but definitely there is value for this lower footprint and maybe not the willingness to pay more, but at least uh, not to disadvantage the, the recycled product versus, uh, versus a virgin one. So uh, business models, adapted business models to a circular economy, not assuming that the current business model is the best one for the circular economy, dealing with perceptions and um, influencing uh, the buyer to look beyond just um, the financial aspects. Uh, I would say these two are, are big ones. Now, a completely different area, um, but still related to people. One of our uh, sustainability goals is also related to diversity. And, um, and so obviously the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about diversity is either gender or race or origin. Um, and we, we have big goals and that's part of our sustainability objectives. There is one I would, uh, I would highlight, which I think can connect with things like the circular economy. It's the diversity about generations. It's very interesting when, when you see younger generations joining an organization, they bring a level of focus on doing the right things, not, not just um, running the project they are assigned to and, and having the right um, approach and the right core values uh, related to the environment. And that can really influence an organization. So I think there is potential by working on diversity and especially inclusion, listening to these people, uh, there is a potential to bring circular economy inside an organization, not just make it a management thing, a top down thing, but really instill it in the organization and have the entire organization become circular economy compatible, if you want. So these would be my two big challenges among many others. And uh, let, me, let me ask you just uh, to follow up on that, Nicholas, is when you, you said a number of times different business models, and I wonder amongst them, which kind of business model do you think might be most successful? Is it something like selling the service or is it something like taking back the product or what, what are kind of features of perhaps better business models for sustainability? Can be, again, can, can, be several, can be several things, but if I stay within very uh, organized and almost mechanical things, the, um, the take back in considering recycled products and having right from the launch of a new product already a plan on what to do with the recycled part. It might go back in the same cycle or it might, might go in a second cycle, but having that right from the beginning, and again, part of the solution we develop, because when we develop a product, if we take that into account, we might choose different routes to go to the right product for the first application. Mm -hmm. If we do not take that into account, we will definitely not optimize the product for that second life, if you want. And then we need a business model that will valorize the use of the, of the, the part which is, uh, which is recycled, right? So as simple as that. But thinking about it early on and, and thinking about the entire value chain or the double value chain with the right business model can reconnect the financial benefits with the sustainable benefits. Great, thank you. And Andy, um, you've been the last in the line for a while here. So um, you're the last on this question, but I'm gonna let you be the first to answer the next question so you can get ahead. Excellent. Um, so it's two questions, if you can hold this in your mind. One is, you know, you're, you're really hard sustainability challenges. What's giving you uh, the most difficulty? And then also, um, can you say something about how your sustainability objectives are different now than they were five years ago? 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, I'll go for the first point uh, first around challenges around sustainability, uh, uh, sustainability challenges. And I, I come back to our, our main, we're a manufacturing site. We manufacture microorganisms, bacteria, virus. Uh, so I would say the biggest sustainability uh, challenge we have is re reducing our carbon footprint uh, and, and minimizing our environmental impact. And uh, based on the nature of our, of our products that we manufacture, uh, we, again, they're very HVAC uh, uh, intensive because we're producing in clean rooms. So we have lots of requirements around uh, pressure cascades, air exchange rates, use of HEPA filtration, et cetera, ultimately to ensure the purity, potency, and safety of our products. And so uh, it, uh, often when we're producing our, our products in, in our industry, uh, we, um, I would say generating some, some tonnage of carbon emissions is, is uh, often uh, unavoidable and, and, can gener and can consume a lot of energy just in terms of electricity. Uh, that being said, we, we try to break through within a different innovations uh, for, in terms of procedurally and from a process perspective as to what we can do to try to minimize that impact. Uh, an example uh, to try to overcome some of these challenges could be um, some, uh, I would say, reducing the amount of air exchanges uh, in laboratories and off hours, for example. Uh, we, we were still, uh, which enables us to still achieve our pressure cascades, uh, still is uh, compliant and ensures uh, the right level of quality for our products, but does allow us, with just these small adjustments, allow us to re uh, reduce quite a bit of CO2 emissions. And, and this example that I just provided, and again, for people to think about, just one one small adjustment that we can make uh, can, uh, in one of our buildings, saved about 400 ton of carbon emissions uh, annualized. So it, the little adjustments, uh, looking at how to do things differently in a way that uh, keeps uh, your process or our, our site and our products compliant, safe, pure, and potent uh, can make a big impact. So I, I, that was the, the first part. Uh, the second part, and could you repeat the question again? I've already forgotten yes. it. I apologize. Yes, you should, because it's a completely different question. So. So you kind of clear your mind. The question is, um, are your sustainability goals different now than they no. were five years ago? Uh, so five years ago would have been 2015. Yeah. Were there sustainability goals? And yeah. uh, how yeah. have things changed? If they yeah, I, I would say in summary, uh, yeah, things have changed dramatically, I think. And as the, some of the other individuals in the panel have discussed, I would say that the consumer is driving uh, has driven a lot of change uh, within the industry in terms of their requirements uh, we we launched a be green initiative in 2011 uh, across all of our sites and businesses uh, more recently we're accelerating our efforts uh, in all of your uh, in all areas of our business around sustainability so I think we see um, more focus uh, rightfully so uh, in these areas around sustainability um, and I think about, uh, it, to give you an example, coming back to the current pandemic situation, uh, 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 from a business travel perspective, before the pandemic, we have a lot of business travel, as many, as many companies. Uh, and BI uh, 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 engaged in a, Beringer Ingelheim, BI engaged in a carbon offsetting project to reduce half of the, uh, the carbon emissions associated with that business travel. So I would say, um, I would say goals have changed, focus has changed. And uh, it's really excellent to see the level of commitment uh, from our company and from other companies uh, to adapt other goals uh, to, the, to the changing environment. Okay, thank you. Sarah at Okabashi, how um, have your goals changed in the past five years? Have your, has your sustainability environment changed? It, it definitely has. I remember going to, even just three years ago, going to different meetings with, um, you know, really quite sophisticated buyers, whether it's department stores or contract manufacturing and starting to talk about circularity really excitedly and uh, quite often was met with a glazed uh, eye. And, you know, now we're getting calls back from those same players saying, oh yes, now we understand circularity, we understand the importance of it, let's have a discussion. And so I think we've um, gone from sort of um, perhaps having more of a unique perspective within our marketplace to, to having one that's really looked for. And I think that that has put um, very positive pressure on us sort of 
on the R and D side of what we're offering to, um, you know, create more sort of help develop more materials um, and systems and sort of do so in a way of sc scaling up as well. So we haven't changed direction completely, but there is definitely more um, more emphasis and, and pressure on sort of delivering results. Great. Terrific. Jim, anything different in the past five years? Yeah, things are, things are, things are different in the past five years. We've always been pretty um, good stewards of the environment. That's always been a commitment for a long time at YKK. So when you would compare our factories to other competitors' factories, you would see a difference. Um, but five years ago, we would we'd have consistent um, goals to reduce electrical use reduce water use, reduce CO2 emissions within the factories. And those would be set every year and they'd be pursued on an annual basis. Um, this year, in fact, next month, I can't get into too much of the details because they told me I can't because they're going to roll it out next month at the Copenhagen Fashion Summit. But um, you see a whole different world now and um, we're going to put our 2050 plan in place. So we're going to put our 30-year plan together and it's going to rely heavily on the it relies heavily on the UN SDG so it's much more complex and it re relates to sustainability in a broader more human way instead of just okay this is what you do from a water energy and, and CO2 emission which is still critical but you look at it from a broader more complex way on top of that we've got the brands like Adidas and Nike and Patagonia and Levi's and they're making commitments now that they will be 100% recycled you know, by 2023 or 2025, everybody has their own goals. Um, 100% is a big deal. So yeah, we're, we're, we're seeing a lot of changes and we're ready for it. Great. Well, send us this when you can announce it and we will, uh, we will be paying attention and we'll be getting it out to our audience. Yeah. Um, and Nicholas, any changes? that you've seen in sustainability at Solvay in five years and how, how the goals or thinking changed? So a couple of things. So we, we obviously had uh, pretty ambitious goals, uh, improving, uh, you know, greenhouse gases, sources of uh, energy and uh, reductions of waste and uh, use of water. Um, we made really good progress during the last five years. And as you can imagine, when you make good progress and exceed your targets, uh, what happens is that usually your targets become much more ambitious. So basically, the idea is that for all these typical metrics, we are roughly doubling the rate of improvement, if not, if not aiming for more. So, so that's one thing about really the rate of improvement going to another level, building on the, on the momentum we, we generated. Uh, so that's one of the one of the changes. Another one I would um, I would mention it goes back to this link between financials and um, and sustainability. Um, it sounds like something very basic, but for me it's very fundamental. It's the way we present our results. And results were usually very focused on the financial aspects, and you had to go to page whatever in the annual report to see something about sustainability. And we changed that. We now present our results side by side. You have financial results and sustainability results presented side by side. And that sends an amazing message, not only to our investors, but also to our employees. It's integrated our bonus, uh, in our bonus scheme, so people will have their bonus impacted if we, not, if we don't do well on our sustainability metrics. It goes all the way up to the top of the company. Um, and our new CEO, and she really strengthened that, um, that mindset and that link between sustainability metrics and the assessment of performance. So it's, um, I would say the change is about really integrating sustainability in everything we do versus treating it as something on the side, nice to have, but not that critical. Great, thank you. And that also sounds uh, similar to what um, was happening at um, YKK with going from, you know, water, energy, CO2 at the plant to this much bigger and uh, stronger 
stronger ethic. Um, yep. So I'm going to ask uh, Jessica, there could be some questions from the audience and I want to make sure that, um, that um, those questions can be asked. What do you think, Jessica? Yes, we actually have a lot of questions um, from the audience. So what I'd like to do is I will um, read them, but if any of our panelists just want to jump in, so I don't think we need to go around the room to all. Um, so if you just want to answer, please go ahead and answer, and then we'll go on to the next one and hopefully can get through the list. So our first question is, how are your sustainability efforts organized within your companies? Do you have, um, is it centralized with a chief sustainability officer? Um, or is it driven by different departments with a known common goal? Or do departments and divisions have specific KPIs to hit each year? Or are they just opportunistic sustainability achievements? So organization of sustainability departments. I can jump in there. So typically uh, they're, they're centralized and then the, the targets are, are sent to the different, um, I would say functions and ultimately normalized to the different um, locations or sites uh, within that function. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Um, the next question is actually for Nicola. It says, how do you think Solvay's recently announced partnership with the Mitsubishi Chemical Advanced Materials Group will impact the delivery, de delivery timeline of Solvay's sustainability targets? Basically, when, when we um, go into a partnership, the idea is to really uh, combine complementary, complementary sets of either skills or market access or technologies and, um, and to accelerate projects. As long as sustainability is integrated in the design of the project right from the beginning, this kind of, um, of, uh, of partnerships can, can only have a positive impact. If, if nothing else, it will accelerate projects and the implementation of the projects. Again, in the case of sustainability, the, the one I mentioned about uh, Veolia with batteries was, uh, was another great example. So um, I think the, the solutions, the problems are so significant when we talk about step change in sustainability and circular economy, uh, that partnerships are uh, almost an automatic thing to consider. I'm not saying we need partnerships for the sake of partnerships, but the, the complexity of problems and solutions to develop will lead naturally to these kind of uh, combinations. Great, thank you so much. Um, the next question is about sustainability stories. It says, I'm interested in how companies are approaching how they communicate their sustainability stories with the public and perhaps internally as well, and what challenges you face. Maybe Jim or Sarah, do you like to draw? Oh, okay. Go ahead, Sarah, please. No, no, I, well, we, um, you know, I think it, depends on the customer that you're talking to in the audience. So it's really about not just knowing what you're doing, but who you're talking to. For example, when we talk about made in USA products, we can talk about it as locally made, made in USA, um, look, all of these sort of different ways of saying basically the exact same thing. And so, um, it is just, a much, just as much about knowing your audience as it is about what you're doing. Yeah, great. Jim, did you want to address that as well? I mean, I, I can. It's just uh, uh, traditionally we've been really, really good stewards of the environment because our founder had this innate love for the town where he grew up as a kid. And he, you know, we've got this wonderful video of him talking about how he used to play in these streams and why in the world would you, why in the world would you ruin those streams just to make money? It doesn't make any sense if, if this is what you value. And it was just a real person's approach to saving the environment. He, he said this in like the late seventies. And, and we've just been downplaying it too much. We haven't been great storytellers. We've just mostly been just doing. But, but when you think about it, it's a tremendous story. And so we're having a lot of fun right now exploring how we can use uh, social media much better to tell that story, you know, tell the impact of it, and not just 
tell our stolen story only to the to the contract manufacturers and the brands to say the quality of the zipper and this price is a zipper and stuff like that but instead tell the whole world about the story and it, it's a it's a cool story and and talk about ocean source zippers and and neat things like that that can really change things because it's important it's not just a question of tooting your own horn which is something we don't really do much we're not very good at that but if you are engaging in that you need to share that so that others can kind of get those ideas and say i can do that too so it's, it's almost like it's you, you have a you have an obligation to tell that story yes it's it's interesting i um uh, i took this company i'm a third generation shoemaker and it's been interesting to see how the personality of the founder does definitely impact into the culture around sustainability when we started doing closed loop manufacturing in the late 90s and uh, it's only recently that people seem to be waking up to the importance but it comes from values at the end of the day yeah and, and i may add that i mentioned four steps to carbon neutrality here for our site program and the fourth step is communication which in a that which is around telling the story and sharing what we've done uh, uh, with our internal, external uh, stakeholders, customers. It's an important step. Hey, well, thank you everyone um, very much. I think um, that the storytelling and communication is a good place for us to uh, close things out here. We do still have a lot of questions, but at the moment I'm gonna turn it over to Aurelie for some uh, closing comments. And then if there are those who you know, want to remain on the line a little longer, we have a couple more questions. But Aurelie, if you'd like to close us out. <clears throat> Thank you, Jessica. And hi, everyone. I'm Aurelie de Malibran, a member of the French American Chamber of Commerce in Atlanta. So before wrapping up this webinar, we would like to thank you, our wonderful moderator, Valérie Thomas, and our panelists, Sarah, Nicolas, Andy, and Jim. So thanks for sharing with us your approach of sustainability. Thanks also to all the persons passionate about sustainability who actually worked behind the scene in order to make this event a success. And I'd like to thank you, uh, Rose Catherine, as well, uh, as a group leader of the Women's Series for making this uh, event happen and turning our vision into a reality today. And finally, this event would have just uh, never existed without all of you attending from uh, different parts of the world. So thanks for your time today, for your passion, and please stay tuned to our organizing partners for future events. To conclude uh, briefly, if I may borrow uh, the few last words from a very visionary French writer you might know, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, we do not in inherit the hearth from our ancestors, but we borrow it from our children. So thanks everyone for joining and have a wonderful day. There are a few more questions if um, we want to go on to just a few more, if, this, if there are still others who are... Um, hanging on here, but we had a question um, here about the consumers, um, the consumer question, if consumers are struggling to pay a higher price for more sustainable products, do you see a way for state governments to better incentivize more su sustainable manufacturing of sustainable products, um, which would then benefit the states by bringing relief to already overburdened landfills? So whether the governments can do anything to incentivize. I mean, I'm sure there's a thousand ways the government can, can, can do that. I think the real driver, however, will be um, more of the storytelling. Um, and I'm very optimistic about the next generation of consumers. Um, I think they're, they're already keyed in. I think we have great avenues to share. You know, they're, they're, they're more informed. Um, they're, they're, they're getting information from a number of different sources, Instagram and TikTok and places like that. And, and we need to lean into that and share more stories. And then that'll be kind of more of the behavior. I guess there's, gov there's role for governors. I'm thinking about smoking, right? I mean, people used to smoke on a plane. And when I was a teenager, I smoked on a plane. Nobody would smoke in a plane. People won't smoke in a restaurant. You wouldn't even, you wouldn't even smoke anywhere. You know, and maybe government has a role to play with that, but maybe also uh, society has a bigger role to play to make that just not acceptable. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with what Jim said. Um, you know, I come from a country, Switzerland, where more than 90% of the glass is recycled. And it has been like that for a couple of decades. And there is zero incentive, nothing. All right. It's just exactly what you described. Right? And you just feel very bad putting a, a, a piece of glass anywhere but in a, in a recycling container. Now, having said that, I think there are areas where you might have some incentives, you might have some regulatory frameworks being put in place, but we have to be extremely careful because very often these are not just fact and science based, but there is a little bit of an emotional and political aspect that diverts it from the, from the right intention. So it has to be designed with extreme care because you can have some uh, side effects that are not exactly what. Uh... We actually had a similar, you know, question um, related to that about regulatory requirements. It was, this person was asking how much of a challenge is it to meet those requirements, um, especially material traceability and consistent quality when using green materials. And it says, I can see this being a challenge for bio-derived materials to meet government requirements. Yeah, it can be, it can be a challenge. Again, that, that's why I was saying what I was saying before. And uh, these um, requirements have to be designed in a way to really achieve the, um, the intent and, and not be diverted or uh, uh, generate, in fact, a side effect that is worse than the original effect uh, we expected. Uh, so traceability is, um, is, uh, is one example, uh, and there are a lot of, uh, of similar uh, examples. So uh, it can be an issue, but there are ways to avoid that if, um, if uh, the requirements are designed the right way, I think. The, uh, the thing about traceability is that, you know, especially in a global economy where, where products are coming from foreign countries and not all those foreign countries, have the same feeling about regulatory controls that the United States does or other, other countries. So um, traceability can be a challenge when, when you're relying on certifications of suppliers from all around the world. And, and it's a certification, it's a piece of paper with a stamp on it. Um, yeah, very good point, I agree. Where's that, where's that, what, what good is that stamp? Especially if the agency is a US government agency and its mandate can't go beyond the borders of its own country. Yeah, and same thing with regulatory, okay? Everybody has to play the, the game according to the same rules and uh, it's not always an easy one to, to achieve. Yeah, you over-regulate over and then those who are doing the right thing or, or, or within the, the confines of your borders will be the ones who are punished because they're adding on all their costs while their non-compliant foreign importers or foreign exporters into your country are not compliant. Yeah. But certified. Mm -hmm. um, we had another question about um, vendor selection. So does sustainability factor into your vendor selection? And if so, um, have you seen a positive trend in vendors becoming more proactive in their own sustainability efforts? We are, we are, we, we are vertically integrated. So we tend to do a lot of uh, our, you know, we, we're manufacturing from pretty basic materials. Um, so I think our, our, we, we're the vendor. And so I think the answer is yes, because our customers are the brands a lot of the U.S. brands are demanding that we operate in a certain way and we are responding, yes. Yeah, pretty similar answer on my side. Uh, you know, for example, one of our big uh, ingredient is, is energy. And, and the way we select our sources of energy will, uh, will have a big impact on our footprint. And uh, so, yes, we, uh, we select sources of energies that are in line with our, with our goals. Okay, great. And uh, someone was asking about, um, what about tax benefits or other government benefits that companies could qualify for in their journey towards sustainability? Is, are, those, are there helpful incentives in place? 
Uh, we have a facility in California that's 100% solar powered. And the California regulations around or incentives for solar power are better than others. And that has proven to be a strong incentive. Yes, absolutely. Uh, exactly the same thing uh, in, in our case. I, I would just uh, go back to the vendor, vendor thing. Um, this is the beginning of a, of a big trend. We are very, very far from uh, the ultimate situation. So, so I think you, you begin to see um, that influence on, uh, on vendor selection. Uh, I, I think it's, um, there is a lot to gain in this area as well. Great. Um, and there was another question actually uh, for you, um, Nicola. There, uh, this person's asking, can we expect plastic recycling to be cost effective in the years ahead? So uh, it, it's, uh, it's a great and tough question. So you have several ways to recycle uh, plastics. And, uh, and let's focus on the ones that uh, are uh, what we call thermoplastic polymers. In other words, plastics that you melt to, to shape. Uh, not the ones that react when you shape them. And um, so you can recycle these polymers reasonably easily. You just regrind them and, and go back into the, the molding cycle, assuming they are clean. Uh, and that's especially efficient when you make the parts. So if you take um, uh, low quality parts or screws and runners, you can really do that very efficiently. The issue is obviously when uh, you have a blend of different plastics, you need to select, you need uh, to, to go into this separation, which is difficult, in some cases almost impossible and, and costly. The other aspect is that some of the polymers, especially if I look at our polymers, we focus on very high performance polymers, so polymers that are very thermally and chemically stable, which is great for the application and the durability, but when you want to recycle them, that's an issue because you would love to degrade them in a control way. And so for me, the, the future of plastics recycling is, is really going into chemical recycling, not just remelting what can be, what can be melted, but really going back to ingredients, to the, the small molecules, if you want, to really have a clean circle uh, enabled by that. A lot of R&D to be done in that area. Still. Great, thank you. All right, we got uh, two more questions here. So, so we'll, we'll finish those up in the last five minutes. Um, the next one is, what is the best way to get shareholder buy-in for sustainability, as opposed to simply providing increased stock value growth? So it's Jack Welch style. How to do that is, is difficult. Now we are a little bit in a special situation in Solvay because the founding families uh, still control the company um, and have a strong presence on our board and they have basically sustainability in their DNA and they we kind of talk to them without having a lot of questions about are we doing the right things and do we have the, the right priorities around sustainability uh, and frankly speaking that's a very tough question but the, the good thing the positive one is that we start seeing investors uh, taking into account sustainability. You even have funds that are sustainability funds that will only buy stocks from companies that have a certain profile from a sustainability point of view. So now you begin to see a direct financial implication of being or not being sustainable. Now again, it's beginning. It's not the majority of the investors, um, but it's coming. I think going back to the point that was made before, I think the new generation, these generations be, who are very sensitive to these questions will be the, the, the investors of tomorrow. And even now they influence their parents, the previous generation. And I think that is starting to, to have an impact on, uh, on the way investments are made. Okay, great. Jim, do you see that or? Yeah, we, we're, we're, we're a privately held company as well, and we're driven by our core values, and our constituents include the communities, the employees, our customers, and our suppliers. And shareholders will reap value, in our estimation, 
by taking care of those constituencies. Maybe that's a special or Japanese concept, but it, it's worked. I mean, it's worked. We continue to be a pretty successful company, but um, mm -hmm. so we get the benefit of not being something like a publicly traded company. I am optimistic that even publicly traded companies will understand that their sales will come from sustainable products and they will not have sales from products that are not part of the sustainability goals because people won't buy them. All right, and uh, the last question actually is for you, um, Jim, and it uh, relates to that. This question uh, says, is simple retasking of used zippers as opposed to any sort of physical or mechanical processing part of recycling circular economy goals? And how feasible is that given wear and tear tolerance specs for different markets? So can the zipper itself be reused? Yes, the, our zippers can. Um, in fact, one of the challenges you had it with fast fashion, you know, the, the opposite of sustainability is something like a fast fashion, um, where, you know, it would be on the runway one day and the next day it would be at H&M. Um, the, where people would buy some clothes and wouldn't wear them as long as they used to wear them. So we would have a zipper, we say this zipper is good for 5,000 up and down. And uh, they'd be like, we don't care. Why, why, why would you even want, nobody's gonna wear it 5,000 times. So, so certainly zippers are going to be uh, capable of, of doing that. Um, I, I hope to, be able to, we'll start to roll out more products as to how you can use your fasteners or disengage your fasteners from clothes and then re-engage them again. Yes, that is possible. All right, well, great. Well, that is the end of the, um, the questions for our panelists who are still here. So thank you everyone who hung around to the very end um, to listen to the questions. And I believe, um, Yoshi, do you want to make a comment about how people might get the recording afterward? Sure. Yes. Thank you again for everyone for joining us uh, today for just a wonderful uh, webinar and discussion about sustainability and how manufacturing companies are using it uh, with their strategy moving forward. Uh, we will be sharing all of the uh, the video content uh, once we do just some minor editing uh, to everyone who joined us and who weren't able to join us too. So if you can um, uh, look out for an email from us uh, this week. That would be great. And we'll be sharing uh, the full webinar, including the, the final few questions that we had after the, the official end of the program too. So please look out for an email from us. Uh, and then we'll have a short survey uh, once you finish and close out the webinar window. So please uh, uh, take a moment to uh, send us your feedback and uh, kind of uh, get any suggestions and advice to uh, ways we can improve in the future. So thank you again, everyone.